there was just one kind of uh, one color, say there was only one color, say blue, which is a nice color, but everything was blue. And there was only one kind of food, say it was pizza or maybe kachoris. And there was only one, uh, everybody looked the same. So every time you look around, you see yourself. And in other words, there was no variety in life. Even if something is nice in and of itself, it becomes enjoyable in relationship to something else. For example, it says that the sky, you look up in the sky sometimes in the evening time, you think that's oh, nice. But if you see the moon, the moon is in full in the sky, then you say, oh, the sky looks so beautiful. So by the presence of the moon in the sky, the sky becomes beautiful, like that. So in relationship to something beautiful, something else becomes beautiful. Mm -hmm. This says that if a woman has a qualified husband, she becomes more beautiful. So yeah, the idea of life is variety and when we see varieties in this world this world is full of varieties in fact in the secular society is always finding ways to create or to come up with new varieties in all spheres of existence because in the material world, one cannot enjoy anything for a period of time without getting tired of it or getting, what we say, immune to it or getting, what we say, a little bit neutral towards it. Therefore, in the material world, there are varieties which are natural. But then again, it just to keep life moving in a certain direction in the material world, materialists are always inventing more and more varieties. Even though it's the same thing, if they can come up with more varieties of food, that, that's considered to be a kind of enjoyment to try another kind of food. So variety, as Prabhupada says, is the mother of mother of uh, enjoyment. But in the spiritual world, there are unlimited varieties. Sometimes materialist people mistakenly think that material means variety and spiritual means without variety. But actually, in the inception of, or the way you say the basic principle of spiritual realization, which is called Brahman realization, there are no varieties in that level of realization. Everything becomes one in spirit. But on the higher platforms or more complete platform of spiritual realization, then we find that there are more and more varieties. And then, of course, in the spiritual world, Krishna has so many different friends and each of the friends have a particular personality and they serve Krishna accordingly and they give Krishna a particular type of pleasure. So in the spiritual world, everything is unlimited. So varieties are not only constantly in what we say, it's they're there all the time, but there's always newer and newer varieties coming up in the spiritual world and how to serve Krishna and how to please Krishna. So variety is the mother of enjoyment. I think the cliche that it's used in the secular society is variety is the spice of life. It gives life some uh, excitement. So yeah. So in the spiritual world, there's unlimited varieties, but the varieties don't get old. 
although one may be doing the same service, just like even now in the material realm of service, when we do service, we find that we can do the same service over and over again and find pleasure in each time because the dynamicism or the dynamic principle of spirit is that it is unlimited. Whereas in the material context, an activity will reach a certain limit of its uh, development and then that's it. But in spirituality, there's no limit. So there's no limit how much one can enjoy the same activity, although the activity is the same. So this is the difference between material and spiritual. Material, people are trying to look for new varieties in order to find happiness. And then they get, they get tired of it, so they change into something different. But in the spiritual world, uh, there are unlimited varieties, and even doing the same thing over and over again causes unlimited happiness. So we use a little bit of a, you know, a cliche or a statement of wisdom, which says that in the, in the material world, there's satiation, but no satisfaction. Uh, just like a sponge. A sponge can only hold so much water, and then it's satiated. You can't put any more in it. But in, this, in the spiritual realm, you get satisfaction without satiation. Satisfaction is the principle of all spiritual activities. And one can continue to find newer and more pleasure in the same activity. That's the difference between spiritual and material. It's like chanting the holy names of the Lord. We can just continue to chant, chant, chant. And then more we chant, the sweeter it gets. And the more sweeter it gets, the more we want to chant. Well, this is spiritual as opposed to material. Mm -hmm. So this realm of material life is just like people generally are not very happy and generally they're not very miserable. They suffer, but they're not so miserable generally, but they're not so happy either. But what makes up the consciousness of the conditioned souls in the material world is that they're bored. Material life is boring. So boring means I get tired, it gets old, it gets stale. It's dry, there's no juice. I'm chewing this bubble gum, chewing gum. I'm getting all the flavor out of it. I'm still chewing, there's no flavor left. So I think, let me get a new piece of, but this is material. Material life is just, it's kind of, it's, it's characteristic, it's characteristic is it's boring. It's boring. But spiritual life is never boring. It's always exciting, different, uh, full of surprises, and interesting. So one who takes up spiritual life enthusiastic will also understand this principle. Mm -hmm. Okay, these are some things we can think about. Um, therefore, one should uh, see that uh, spiritual life has all the ingredients for happiness that the soul is looking for. Material life uh, presents itself as being the solution for the problems that people experience, the problems of boredom and unhappiness, but it just continues. Why? Because it doesn't have any substance to it. It's just the nature of material life. Therefore, the only way the materialists can find any little happiness is that they keep changing, changing, changing. And they consider this change a source of happiness like that. And you see that, how, how people live life in that way. 
they have a relationship and they change to another relationship. People change their marriage partners, they change their friends, they change situations, change, change, change. And then of course, um, they have a car and they want another car, a different car. After some time, they have a computer, they want another one. Uh, so change, and, and the society knows that, so they always come up with ideas on how you can change for the better. And so people somehow find excitement in life through the process of just changing, changing, changing. But that is just the feature of ignorance because each of the activities they perform has no real enjoyment attached to it. And on the spiritual platform, relationships have unlimited happiness because they go beyond the body, they go beyond the mind, they go beyond the intelligence, they go beyond the senses, they go into the soul. And the soul is unlimited in its quality to enjoy. And the Lord Chaitanya said, Anandam Bhuti Vardhanam, unlimited ocean of happiness coming from the chanting of Krishna's holy name. All right, these are some principles that we can think about. I don't know in, uh, if it's there ar around the world. I'm here in Europe, and today is Ekadasi. I'm not sure if it's Ekadasi in the, in the United States or not. But uh, this side of the world is experiencing Kadasi, India, and the world. And so Kadasi is called the mother of devotion, as given by Srila Bhakti Vinoda Kaur. On this day, one can make rapid spiritual advancement by following these austerities of Kadasi and chanting more rounds, reducing bodily, bodily needs and bodily activities and focusing on the process of hearing and chanting like that. And today is a codice in the US also. I just got that message. Okay, thank you. So a codice is 11 days before and after the full moon. It's very auspicious. Um, actually, a codice means to fast completely from all food, including water, and chant for 24 hours. But when Prabhupada instituted the society, he was he knew that the Westerners, not accustomed to such austerities, he gave some concession. And so there's five levels you can follow a codice on. Um, the, the highest is complete fasting from all foods and water and chanting all day. Uh, lower than that is uh, taking water only. Lower than that is taking just fruit and milk. Uh, lower than that is taking only raw foods on this day. And the lowest is just fasting from grains and beans, mm -hmm. which is the minimum that has been instituted like that. Well, why follow the minimum? Try to follow it a little bit more stricter if you can. And but the most important thing on this day is to reduce bodily needs and activities and spend more time hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. Especially chanting Hare Krishna. Okay, so we'll conclude there and see if there's any comments. Questions? Hare Krishna Maharaj, my humble obeisance is all glories to Shri Prabhupada, all yeah. glories to yourself. Um, you, can, you mentioned um, how we have to live a simplistic lifestyle. Um, and my question is, we're always in this um, 
rat raced in the Grahastha ashram where we are um, media and uh, propaganda, how we should have the latest um, gadget to make our life simple. <laughs> and so we have to have the latest phone, the latest television screen. And it's sometimes very difficult, Marge, to be in this Gahasta ashram and live simply. Um, I know you mentioned that um, the way to help us is by actually reading, being more involved in our bhakti yoga. Um, and sometimes it's not that easy, Maharaj. So do you have a magical answer for this, Maharaj? Well, the reason why simplicity in lifestyle and also in activities is, is uh, propagated or recommended is that it's conducive to spiritual practice. That's why it's not, we find that there are people who practice Krishna consciousness who are surrounded with a lot of material opulence, but they're fixed. It's not something that they came into. It's just something that they worked towards. Mm -hmm. So the idea is uh, that simplicity is conducive like that. And as you mentioned, you gave an, the example of having to have the latest of everything. That means, that means there's more money that needs to be made in order to purchase these things, requiring more time and energy and working. So it's a cycle. The more you want, the more you have to earn, the more you have to earn, the more you have to work. More you have to work, that means less time for family, less time for uh, personal needs, less time for Krishna consciousness. So that's the principle of how austere, uh, simplicity works. It's, it allows you a more easier lifestyle where you can take care of uh, even material needs are become easy to take care of. But the best thing to do, and I was reading this in the Bhagavatam this morning, is just simply depend on Krishna and practice Krishna consciousness. And Krishna will send you whatever you need automatically. When he's pleased, when he's, Krishna's pleased with a devotee, he showers upon him everything they need and more. That's Krishna's uh, special kindness towards his devotees. Even if a devotee might think, oh, I, I want this, but actually I don't need it, so I won't try for it. And then Krishna will say, oh, this devotee is so nice, I'll give it to him anyway. That's Krishna. So the recommended thing is to work in such a way that you can take care of your basic needs in life with, without extra endeavor, that means maintaining your family and yourself and the environment that you uh, dwell in and keep that quite simple. Wherever you are now, you don't have to you know, start running around and start looking for a smaller apartment. Just, you know, all you have to do is somehow or other spend more and more time practicing Krishna consciousness. And as you do that, you'll find that your life be, it becomes more simple automatically. So Marge, when we have a desire, um, sometimes the latest phone has come out and uh, we sometimes get carried away that we need this latest phone. It's all singing, all dancing. Is it bad to keep having these desires. Should we try and um, minimize this sort of um, wanting? Well, yeah, it's definitely helpful, spiritual, because you can take those same desires and use them for increasing your Krishna consciousness. I mean, I still have the same phone your husband gave me three years ago. <laughs> I'm sure there's been many additions after that, but it works. So I'm not asking him for another one. You can get so, yeah. 
anytime, Guru Maharaj. <laughs> I have the same computer for the last eight years now. <laughs> Somebody used, people used to tell me you have to change computers every three and four years. And I used to believe that. But now I decided this one works, so I'm not going to change it. So I'll just change it when it doesn't work anymore. So it still works. <laughs> Simplicity is, is one of the recommended principles uh, that is highly conducive to spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. So if you have the latest desire for this, that, and this, and that, you better forget about it. <laughs> just, just go on. If you need something, get it. If you don't need it, just be happy with what you have. Why waste time, energy? Maharaj, when we are living in the Grahastha Ashram, we have children and um, sometimes they actually want the latest gadget or how do we... Um, we tell them youth. if you want to go work for it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> My parents never gave me anything. I had, a, I, had a, I had a job when I was about 11 years old, my first job. <laughs> I had a... Whatever I wanted, I had to earn the money myself to get it. I never, the, the idea of allowance, I never got, never had, a, never had, never came into my life an allowance. My parents never gave me anything because they taught me, you know, you know, you have to depend, you have, if you, whatever you need, you should, you should work for it instead of depending on us for it. We pamper the kids and we give them everything. And well, your children are really good kids. They're intelligent. But some kids, when they get everything by, by ways of the, you know, others, they become lazy. They become spoiled. I think you're right, Maharaj, but um, sometimes um, I'm guilty of this, that you go into that protective mode. Um, rather than let them fall, uh, it's just like, I think I'll stop you from falling and I'll protect you. And that sometimes gets in the way um, of giving them everything. Yeah. Well, you have to decide what's best for them. Thank you, Maharaj. I think we've got a long way to go, Tusha and I. But thank you. <laughs> well, it's fun trying to live with less. Society and other people won't let you, but you find it's fun. I mean, you can collect a lot of books. We do that. Pictures, we do that. But what do you need? Rabbi said, you don't even need a table to eat on. You can sit on the floor and put a little cushion there with a little jokey table. And you have a table. For sleeping, the Bhagavatam says, you don't even need a pillow. You can use your arm. For clothes, the Bhagavatam says, you know, you can always walk around the streets and find some old clothes and put them on. That's the Bhagavatam. <laughs> when I came to New Rindavan, 
uh, you know, sometimes we only came with one pair of clothes, so we didn't have a change of clothes. So there was a, a place where people who had left the community would throw their old clothes. So if anybody needed any clothes, they would refer them to that pile out there. And you'd look through there and see if you found something that fit you. Usually it was full of mildew, so you'd take it and you wash it. And then you'd have a pair of pants or a shirt. That's how we lived in, in New Vrindavan in the old days. And we had one pair of shoes, which were rubber boots, that's all. And, and they were all year round. And somehow if they got holes in it, uh, you'd ask for new boots and you put in your request and it would come about a month or two months later. And sometimes your boots would get holes in it, so you'd uh, put patches on the boots or put some kind of inside. This is how we lived in Nubrindava in the old days. We had nothing. But we weren't in anxiety, we were happy. I didn't have any phone, didn't see a newspaper, didn't know what television was, didn't have a radio didn't have anything, no communication with the outside for years. I didn't even see money for like months at a time, maybe even longer than that. But we were happy. We were serving the Lord, chanting Hare Krishna, dancing, eating prasadam. We look back in those days and think, well, that was nice. That's the way it was for us in the early days. Because the society never, never had, didn't have any money, and any money that came in, because we had no congregation in those days, anybody who was a devotee, they were living already in the temples. There was no such thing as congregation. So where did we get money? If somebody's father donated something to some one of the, one of the kids in the ashram, then we have a little money, and that money would be used for the deities. The deities had nice saris and nice jewelry, and the devotees lived simply. But we were happy. I can actually say we were happy. We didn't even have any hot water. <laughs> <laughs> All year round, we had cold water. <laughs> and you're worrying about an extra phone. <laughs> we didn't even have one phone. <laughs> if we wanted to send a message out, there was one telex machine in one place in the community, and you had to go there and Type it out in the telex. <laughs> there, was no, there was one phone in the community too, and that was not allowed to be used by anybody but the leader of the community. It was nice. Hmm. Simple. No checking account. No credit cards, <laughs> no bank account. <laughs> Radha Swami used to say, <laughs> he say, uh, <clears throat> he used to give lectures in HSBC Bank, which was one of the biggest banks in the world, and he would say, "I here I am giving lectures to the bankers, and I don't even have a bank account." <laughs> Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances, all glories to Srila Prabhupada. Oh, I found that really funny about uh, Radhanath Maharaj giving financial planning advice to bankers 
when he doesn't even have a bank account. That's... He would be, he would always say that in his lectures to, to the bankers. <laughs> Probably the best advice they've had not to have a bank. Account. <laughs> um, I, do, have you heard of a community? It's a Christian community called Bruderhof. Um, hmm. They, it was a, obviously a German. Uh, person that uh, set this up they have communities everywhere but in East Sussex in London in the UK there's about 300 people and this community is um, it's exactly as you've just described it Guru Maharaj, where they, if they need clothing they just go to the clothing department they'll just write out a little note chit and send it off that I need a jacket and the person the clothing department supplies everything and then um if you needed uh, school bags and things everything is supplied within the community and as the documentary goes on they talk about how do they actually get their funds from so they all work for a furniture making um company so they've set up a furniture making organization and that's how they get their uh, funding for and they run everything internally and uh, the devotees that um, work for that furniture making company, they don't get paid. It's just like a service. And all the money that they've uh, generated from that goes into building houses and uh, clothing and feeding all the community. Mm -hmm. And um, f six out of seven days, all 300 members take prashadam in the prashadam hall together. And yeah. they, it's just incredible. Um, it's exactly like, you know, Prabhupada's envisioned. Mm -hmm. Self-sustaining um, yeah. community. This idea of currency is actually a false sense of wealth. And it really has, no, it's, it's an opportunity for people to exploit every, everybody else. Because in more and more rural, rural communities or in life years ago, People would uh, have different skills and they would trade their skills to others and others would give them uh, skills in return. And if anybody had any excess in food, they would give it to a, a person who was in need that for that particular food and that, partic and that person would give them something back. So economy was based on tra uh, trading uh, labor and goods. And there was no tangible or at least any kind of form of uh, what we say money or system. Everything was done in the barter system like that. Now we have this, uh, you have this plastic, right? And you put your plastic in the machine and you think you, you're, you're wealthy. <laughs> you got us a piece of plastic. It's a number in a computer. That's all it is now. Yes. Yeah. Cyberspace. <laughs> There's actually a plan, because I don't know how true this is, to do away with all paper currency all around the world. And they want to make everything through electronics now. And they're going to come up with reasons why this is better, because they'll say, there won't be any thefts like that. But it's just another means of controlling the population. That's all. That, that's already happening in um, China, Guru Maharaj. So, yeah, the, the so he's, and, and everybody just transfers numbers, digits from phone to phone. Yeah, doesn't mean, yeah. That way they can control the population. Yeah. First, they try to control the, control the food supply, and then they try to com control the wealth, the, the, the money supply. Food supply is first. Once they can control that, then they can control everybody. So the whole idea is to, get, to destroy farming, and create these big farms, they call them factory farms, which are run by corporations. And then all the food goes into these big organizations like Cargill and Monsanto. And so they'll be the food distributors 
for everyone like that. And then they produce their own seeds for those people who are still trying to farm. And you have to keep buying a new seed every year. The seed is useless after once, once using it. So their whole plan, actually in the United States, they introduced a bill. It went to Congress, but it didn't pass. It actually didn't pass, but the, the bill was that uh, to, to have your own farm, to, have, to grow your own food will become illegal. Anyone is caught growing their own food would be fined and punished. That was the bill. Fortunately, it didn't. It didn't fly. It didn't make it. But they still have plans to do something similar to that in the future. Yeah. So. If there's a nice book, if you want to read it, it's called Spiritual Economics. It's by one Prabhupada disciple called Dineshwara. And he's written this book called Spiritual Economics. It's interesting. It's a, it's a good read. Anybody can put it up on the chat and maybe reference it to where you can find it. It might be on Amazon, I don't know. Spiritual economics. <laughs> Anybody wants to know more about this, just listen to Srila Prabhupada's morning walk lecture, uh, December 31st, 1973, Los Angeles. Well, but the whole lecture, he talks about economy, wealth, and various types of uh, systems and how they work. Uh, it's interesting. That's December 31st, the last day of the, of the year, 1973, Morning Walk, Los Angeles, California. Ramaj, is is it the um, his his um, material name is Eric Butterworth? Hmm? Say that again. The spiritual economics um, book is it by Eric Butterworth? No, his name is Daneshwar. Oh, okay. I'm still looking for it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This is available on Amazon. Krishna Maharaj Vivek here. Please uh, accept my this small glory to Srila Prabhupada. Who's speaking? Maharaj Vivek here. Vivek. Vivek. Okay. And okay. Thank you, Maharaj, for allowing us to join these classes. Maharaj, you mentioned about variety. And uh, I feel like, yes. Like in material world, uh, we have so many things, so many variety, but still we don't feel uh, satisfied or we don't feel very happy. While in spiritual like things, like uh, we see the same deity, we read the same words again and again, we chant the same Mahamantra, but we feel so happy, so like, like relaxed. So I think this is the difference in the material and spiritual objects. Like in material world, in spite of so much variety, we don't feel happy while spiritually, like same things give so much pleasure. Yeah, that's the difference between material and spiritual. We explained that early, earlier. Our material is limited and spiritual is unlimited. Spiritual is the nature of the soul's relationship where material is simply based on the mind and senses. Mind and senses are always changing. So, 
No, I just wanted to feel like in material world, when we think about spiritual things, it's so much happiness. How beautiful that spiritual world actually will be. Yeah, that's, that's the actual nature of the spiritual world. It's called, it's called Rasa Vaisa. Rasa Vaisa, that is, it's fully and completely blissful and joyful. And the more we emphasize the spiritual, the more the principles of knowledge and happiness uh, reveal themselves more and more. Yeah, so because we're spiritual beings, we're not material beings. We have a material body, but we are spiritual by nature. We can't find satisfaction through the material, although we can find some temporary relief from suffering by using certain material things. We can't find happiness through the spirit, through the material. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Vigrek. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj, I found him. Uh, it was his material name is Rus, R-O-U-S-S-E, Dhaneshwara Das. Yeah, that's it. So, yeah. I've, I've put a link into the chat. Yeah, it's good. It's an interesting book. Mm. Uh, yeah, Manasi Ganga has also added something that there's a seminar you can find on the Google also. Dineshwar was very, he's very enthusiastic. He's been doing this for many, many years. Okay, any more comments and questions? Okay, thank you very much. We can uh, Break now, we'll see you all tomorrow. Hare Krishna, thank you very much for a lovely class, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Uh, no, no. Glory to Prabhupada. Thank you. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Be well. Thank you very much, Guru. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the lovely class. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.